good morning, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Courtney Doggart, and I'm the president of Network 2020. Um, I will actually, usually I try to wait a few seconds for people to jump on, but I know we have a lot of interest in this event, and, um, and I know there's a lot of ground to cover, so I will actually get started right now. So we're very pleased that we have Professor Kishore Mabubani with us today to, to talk through um, the future of US-China relations. Um, and he has a lot of interesting things to say about this. Um, just as quick background um, about Network 2020 for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we are a New York-based nonprofit organization that is really focused on promoting informed conversations around foreign affairs. Uh, we are a community, we're a global network. Um, we do talks like these, we also do research trips um, to countries and regions of really critical importance. We've been to Ukraine, Southeast Europe, Iran, Pakistan over the years. Um, so we, we really try to provide a lot of opportunities for listening and understanding what's happening on the ground. Um, so please do, I encourage you to check out our website, to follow us on YouTube, Twitter, and all the usual places. Um, so with that, a little bit about Professor Mabubani. Um, I'm sure most of you, know him quite well. He is, he is a giant in the foreign policy world. Um, there's a few words up on the screen about him, um, but you know, just as a more um, a textual understanding of, of who he is, he's, you know, I think he's the kind of person, he's, a, he's been a good friend to Western countries over the years, and like any good friend, I think he's, he's able to tell hard truths or things that one doesn't always want to hear, and so I think that uh, this conversation tonight should be very eye-opening and very interesting. Um, and just so you all know how this will run, what I will do is we'll be asking a few questions of Professor Mabubani uh, for the, about the first half of the program, and then we will open it up to Q&A. And if at any point you have any questions, please do uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A box uh, during the actual event. So um, with that, Professor Mabubani, welcome, and thank you so much. Um, I know it's, it's morning time in, in Singapore, so thank you for waking up and, and joining us. And, um, and, and to all who are listening, too, thank you. I know that it can be a, quite a double header because we have the US presidential debates following this. So it's, a, it's an evening of substance. So um, mm. just to start with your books, um, you've really written extensively about world order and the viability of Western centrality alongside a rise in Asian leadership. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the foundations of your last two books, Has the West Lost It and Has China Won? Um, you know, what motivated you to write these books? And, um, and if you can just describe for those listening a little bit about the, these really tectonic shifts in world primacy between the US and China. Mm. Uh, thank you, Courtney. I'm very, very happy uh, to join you this morning. Uh, and I want to thank you for emphasizing a very important point that I also want to reiterate at the beginning, that I'm actually a friend of the West. <laughs> uh, you know, because I know I'll obviously be making very critical remarks uh, about what the West has been doing. But uh, I, I'm in a sense, my, my goal is to really help the West understand how much the world has changed. And to me, what is quite shocking is that, you know, in the West, you have the best newspapers in the world like the New York Times, the, the best universities in the world, like Harvard and Yale. And yet many of the leading minds in the United States are not aware of the major tectonic shift that is happening right now uh, in, in world history, which is that we are coming to the end of the era of Western domination of world history. And, so in, and to understand that, it's important to understand that if you look at the past 2,000 years, from the year one to the year 1820, for 1800 out of the last 2000 years, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. So it's only in the last 200 years that Europe took off, followed by the United States. But if you view the past 200 years of world history against the backdrop of the past 2000 years of world history, the past 200 years of world history, uh, Western domination of world history have been an aberration. Now, all aberrations come to a natural end, and that's what we are seeing today. And, and just to put it, uh, emphasize that fact, 
Today, in purchasing power parity terms, the number one economy in the world is China, number two is the United States, number three is India, number four is Japan. Three are the top four already uh, uh, Asian uh, economies. But the minds of all the policy makers, in, especially in the United States and to some extent in Europe, are still set in the 19th and 20th century, when the 21st century will be very different. And so to give uh, uh, Western minds a guide to the Asian century, which is what the 21st century will, will be about. That's why I, I wrote these two books, uh, Has the West Lost It, which actually was also made into a TED talk. And then uh, Has uh, China Won? And the goal of these two books is to help the West deal with a world that it can no longer dominate. And so I hope in that sense, people will recognize that. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, just to just to press on this a little bit more, um, I'd like to you know we we were talking earlier about how um, you you've run into someone else who who spoke recently to Network Twenty Twenty, and that's uh, Parakana, and he had spoken this past spring and was talking about um, the rise of regionalism um, and in global leadership. And so I'd just like to hear you react a little bit to to his idea mm. about regionalism, particularly in a place as diverse as Asia. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, Parak Khanna is a good friend. In fact, he lives uh, within a couple of kilometers of my house. I ran into him at the beach a few days ago. Uh, yes, I agree with him that uh, regionalism is, is important. In fact, uh, the second most successful regional organization in the world is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. For short, it's number two after the European Union. And indeed, I co-authored a book uh, uh, with my friend Jeffrey Sung on the ASEAN miracle. So I do believe that regionalism is important. But to balance that, I also have to say that history is driven by great powers. And so what we will see, uh, the reason why I wrote that my book has China won is that in the next uh, 10 years, what will drive global geopolitics is the rising geopolitical contest within the world's number one existing power today in a comprehensive term, which is the United States, and the world's number one emerging power today, which is China. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, I, of course, this is what I predicted, but it's coming true, uh, the US-China geopolitical contest will get worse uh, uh, in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. And by because it's driven by a 2,000 year logic of world history, which is that whenever the world's number one emerging power, which today is China, is about to overtake the world's number one power, the world's number one power, the United States today, will try to push down the world's number one emerging power, which is China. And, and, I, and I document in great detail in my book, Has China Won, why that is happening and what are the structural forces uh, driving it. Thank you. Um, just to just to follow up on that point a little bit, I know that there are others who've who've talked about this the, the, the rising power and the falling power. I think Graham Allison comes to mind, um, and and I think in his case, you know, it, it winds up in in actual conflict. Um, what do you think that that the, the West can and should be doing in this case, well, so that we don't wind up in conflict? Yeah. Well, I think. You know, I mean, that's exactly why I, I wrote my book, because I, I see this U.S.-China geopolitical contest as being completely unnecessary. And what's happening is that this geopolitical, you're right, Graham Allison has written about this, and I agree with his thesis, uh, except that he says war is more likely than not. I disagree with that. <laughs> I don't think war is likely within a, a two nuclear powers because in a nuclear war, uh, you don't have a winner and a loser, you have a loser and a loser. <laughs> so hopefully there'll be no war uh, between the United States and China, although there's a danger of a skirmish in the next month or so with the South China Sea possibly. But going back to this US-China geopolitical contest, I think I want to emphasize that this is a contest that can and should be avoided. Because, you know, I mentioned how the world's number one power is always trying to push down the world's number one emerging power. I think the strategic decision that the American people need to make is what's more important for America? Is it its primacy being number one or is it its people 
and, and you know, uh, the, the sad part about the United States is that even though the United States has been by far uh, the most successful country since human history began, that's, that, that, that there'd be no doubt about that, the, uh, the Amer United States is also the only major developed country uh, where the average income of the bottom 50, 50 percent has gone down over a 30 year period. And of course, there are complicated reasons for that. America has become a plutocracy and so on and so forth. But I think what, what, what should be America's priority today is to focus on improving the well being of its people. And the best way to improve the well being of its people actually is to avoid this geopolitical contest with China and frankly also work with China and the rest of Asia to come up with a win-win uh, solution whereby uh, uh, United States can improve the conditions and well-being of its people, China can be better off, and there's actually fundamentally no reason why they should go to a headlong contest. But, you know, words of reason, as you know, in theory are supposed to be very effective. <laughs> uh, in practice, <laughs> words of reason cannot suppress the primordial instincts that drive countries sometimes. And in the case of the U.S.-China relationship, what makes it even harder to, uh, to why the reason why reason is harder to use is that to some extent, the U.S.-China geopolitical contest is being driven by an emotional dimension, a subconscious emotional dimension, where there has been always a fear in the Western psyche of a yellow peril. So if you, if you, if you have the yellow peril uh, stalking in your mind, you think that China is an existential threat and you go all out into this contest when in fact the forces of voices of reason will tell you stop. You don't really have to go through with this contest. Thank you for, for, for that. Um, I think, you know, I just someone, I wanted to, to follow up on, on some of your points a little bit about um, about why you think, as a friend to the West, why you think that we're missing the boat on this, or why why we're not realizing that there are these major shifts that are happening and, and not able to adjust. Well, I mean, this is where um, you. I think the first question. I know I was a diplomat for thirty three years, and so the first question is how are policies being made towards China? And the answer is that the dedicated group of policymakers in very senior positions in the established institutions, in the State Department, in CIA, in the Pentagon, and to some extent uh, also in the Congress and elsewhere. And, 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 and the important thing is to ask what are the assumptions in their minds? And the assumption in their minds is that if the United States loses its number one position, then United States, the people will be worse off if United States is no longer the number one power in the world. Now, that's an assumption that's deeply embedded, and it comes from uh, what I call 19th century uh, assumption about geopolitics. But I also emphasize that the world has changed Fundamentally, the U.S. and China, in a sense, like all the other 191 countries, were on different boats before, right? Like 193 different boats on the ocean. But now with the world having shrunk and the, the 193 countries are no longer 193 separate boats on the ocean, they're 193 separate cabins. Uh, on the same boat. But the problem with our global board is that you have captains or crews or governments taking care of each cabin and no one taking care of the global board as a whole. Now, just to extend the global board analogy uh, just a little bit more, if the board catches fire, the stupidest thing that the, the, the passengers can do is to argue about who started the fire. That's absolutely stupid. Because you first put out the fire, then you, can, then you can start the argument about who started the fire. But you saw that when COVID-19 broke out, and COVID-19 is a threat to the whole world, and, and, and we should have all come together to fight against COVID-19. Instead, the United States and China had a huge argument about who started COVID-19. It doesn't matter who started it. What matters is that you've got to put it out. But the fact that the US and China, in a sense, behave irrationally, 
uh, in response to COVID-19 by having this massive argument uh, showed that showed, showed how the, the US-China geopolitical contest is being driven by irrational forces and not rational forces that should be the case. And, and, and so that's why it's very, very important to visit the deep assumptions behind policy making. And, and, and this is what, again, what, that, what's what worries me about the American establishment. You have a society in which uh, everything is challenged, but you know, in the United States, if any politician stands up to say something, which is, by the way, probably going to happen, eh? that the United States will become the number two economy in the world, that politician will be shot for saying something which is going to happen. Now, how is it in the land of free speech where you can say everything or anything you want? You cannot talk about what's going to happen inevitably. So that's how I hope my book is helpful. I mean, why? And, and by the way, even if America becomes the number two economy, actually the people of America can be better off and their lives can improve if they adjust better to this new world. I mean, the, the Americans, the, the, the American, the ordinary American may actually have a much better life when America is number two and adjust to a different world than when it's trying to be number one forever. And that's how my book, I hope, is a gift to Americans. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to point out to those who are listening that uh, just this past week in foreign affairs, um, I don't think it was in the magazine, I think it was on the website, but ambassadors William Burns and Linda Thomas-Greenfield just published a, a really amazing article. I think it was about the transformation of the State Department, um, which doesn't have a wonderful title, but, um, but the substance of the article is actually a lot like what you were saying, Professor Mabubani, and they said that, um, and I quote, US diplomacy has to accept the country's diminished but still pivotal role in global affairs. It has to apply greater restraint and discipline, and it must develop a greater awareness of the US position and more humility about the wilting power of the American example, which is um, you know, some, some rather a splash of cold water from, from within. So, um, but, but just to follow up on a point, you know, one, one thing that I know, you know, at least those of us in Network 2020 who've, who've gone abroad on some of our research trips where we talk to a, you know, a wide swath of society, whether it's you know, leaders in government, business, opposition, um, civil society, you know, so sometimes what we do hear is that U.S. leadership is critical to at least getting some of the right players to the table. Um, in in your vision, as you project over the coming decades, you know how how would something like that work? Where where you have countries that you know maybe squabbling or having differences, and they and they want someone to come in. Um, you know, what, how does that reconcile with this idea of, oh, you know, either the wilting power of the U.S. example, or you know, at least a diminished power on the world stage? Yes, uh, I, I completely agree. Uh, I think U.S. leadership is very important in the world, and certainly, I mean, as you know, in, in let me uh, in a lot of my writings, I emphasize that the entire global multilateral architecture the rules-based order that was created after World War II in 1945 was essentially a Western, or more accurately, an American gift to the world. So the whole family of United Nations institutions, the Bretton Woods institutions, were all gifts of America to the world. And, 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 and so most countries in the world would like to see uh, US leadership. But if I may be a bit blunt, there's a subtle difference between American leadership and American bullying. <laughs> so, uh, what happened, and, and let me be very candid about this, you know, I, I worked with some brilliant American diplomats, okay? When I was ambassador to the UN first time, I worked with General Vernon Walters, who could speak 13 languages. When I was ambassador to the UN, the second time I worked with John Nagroponte. So America has had brilliant diplomats, but the whole point about diplomacy is that diplomacy it's about persuasion. It's about trying to persuade the other person to accept your point of view. As you know, one of the uh, <laughs> most common definitions of a diplomat is that a diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell in such a way that you feel you're going to enjoy the journey. 
<laughs> that's the definition of a diplomat. But unfortunately, what happened after the Cold War, uh, United, we, we went from a bipolar world to a unipolar world. And so the United States got used to being a uni, living in a unipolar world. It began to act more and more unilaterally. And as a result, the United States, because it could, just did a lot of arm twisting. And, and as a result of that, you notice uh, the American influence in the world has been sliding down. But America can go back. And this is exactly what I think uh, the two great authors you mentioned, Bill Burns and Linda Thomas Greenfield, was talking about, which is that let's go back to diplomacy and use the art of persuasion. And certainly, I can tell you in East Asia, in Southeast Asia, I want to emphasize one thing. Southeast Asia is the most diverse place on planet Earth with 650 million people. Uh, you have uh, 200 or a million Muslims and Buddhists and uh, uh, Mahayana Buddhists, Hinayana Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, Taoists, Confucianists, you name it, we have it uh, in Southeast Asia. But in this critical area, there's a, there are huge reservoirs of goodwill towards America huge reservoirs but for america to exploit the reservoirs it's got to exercise diplomacy and not arm twisting and 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 so you know and, and you know if you read the, the 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 memoirs of someone like john bolton i mean all he thinks is about using american power to to bash it on, on people's heads and that never works in the long run you know so that's why i would say going back to your your, your question Yes, uh, we do want uh, American leadership, but American leadership of a very subtle and sophisticated kind and not the kind of arm twisting and bullying that became common, unfortunately, uh, after the end of the Cold War. Thank you for that. Um, one, you know, just to, to follow up a little bit um, on the idea of, of leadership and, and diplomacy, um, you were twice ambassador to the UN. Uh, and you've spoken a lot about the importance of multilateralism and achieving goals from, you know, whether it's constraining countries that are violating international norms to addressing some of the you know, challenges of the world. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to just hear, hear your take on, you know, especially now that the UN is you know, celebrating its 75th birthday and a lot of these institutions are, are reaching that similar milestone. You know, how do you think that they can evolve for the future and, and what, what do you see that role being? Uh, well, um, uh, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, I, I believe in uh, multilateralism. And uh, I, I just want to go back briefly to my boat analogy and say that, that as a result of the world shrinking, as I say, the 7.7 .7 billion people who now live in 193 separate countries no longer live in 193 separate boats. They live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. And I want to emphasize when you have global challenges like COVID-19, when you have global challenges like global warming, they all illustrate the point that we are all on the same boat. And so we've got to take care of the boat as a whole. And how do you take care of the boat as a whole? You need institutions of global governance. Now, I want to emphasize the phrase global governance is designed to put people to sleep. <laughs> it sounds very boring, but it's actually very critical, and very essential. And so the most important institution of global governance is the United Nations, because the United Nations is the only uh, universal organization where everybody is represented. All 7.7 .7 billion people are represented in the United Nations. So many people think that the United Nations is a sunset organization that is dying. It's actually a sunrise organization. It will become more important in the 21st century. I have no doubt about that at all. But of course, the, the question then is, why is the United Nations so weak today? And the answer is that it is weak, not by accident, but by design. And let me, let me give away a, a big secret, which everyone knows in the UN, but which the New York Times, by the way, has never reported, <laughs> uh, which is that, you know, in, if you want to make an organization strong, the way you make an organization strong <laughs> is that you pick a chief executive officer who's strong, dynamic, visionary, hardworking, and determined to change the world, which is what a Secretary General of the UN should be. But if you have all of those qualities, you're completely disqualified from being UN Secretary General 
because the five permanent members uh, who control the United Nations, namely United States, United Kingdom, France, China, and Russia, the P5, they disagree on a lot of things. But what they agree upon is that they want a Secretary General who's weak and spineless and pliable. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to put it so bluntly. And I do that because on the one hand, the United States always complains, why is the United Nations so weak? And the answer is the United States made the United Nations very weak by selecting secretary generals who, who were so pliable. And so how do you expect the United Nations to be strong? And, and of course, in my, I've written a whole book about this, also called The Great Convergence, where I point out it is actually in, in America's national interest and actually is also in the interest of the Western countries and the Western populations who now make up a minority of 12% of the world's population it's in the interest of the affluent minority to have stronger institutions of global governance. So what I recommend is that United States and Europe and all make a U-turn away from their policies of weakening multilateralism and switch to policies of strengthening multilateralism because that is in the long-term interest of the West. And so once again, I say, as a friend of the West, I'm saying, you, you are shooting yourself in the foot by weakening multilateral institutions. Please do the opposite. And, and, and that would be better for, for United States of America and better for Europe. Thank you. That will, we'll, we'll, we'll take it under advisement, so <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, just to return to a little bit about the, the, the topic of the talk, which is really we're looking at US-China relations. Um, I know a lot of people have used the analogy of the current U.S.-China dynamic as uh, they're, they're turning to a Cold War analogy. Um, and so I'd love to hear your reactions to that. Well, I, I, I think the, the Cold War analogy is a very dangerous one to use because it's exactly the wrong set of spectacles uh, to where to understand what's happening within the United States and China. There are fundamental differences. Okay? And let me just mention a few. The first fundamental difference is that the Soviet Union actually was competing globally with the United States by saying that our ideology of communism is superior uh, to the American ideology of capitalism. And communism can deliver a better life. And so, there, and as you know, Khrushchev very famously said, you know, communism will bury capitalism, right? That's what the Soviet Union said. So there was a real head-on clash. Now, guess what? China is run by the Chinese Communist Party, it's true. But if you want to meet the world's best capitalists, go to China. <laughs> China has effectively become a capitalist country and China has, is not exporting communism at all. Not at all. In fact, when Mr. Deng Xiaoping came to Singapore in 1978, the Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, said to Mr. Deng Xiaoping, how can we become friends of China if you are supporting communist parties in Southeast Asia that are trying to overthrow our governments? And guess what? China stopped 40 years ago supporting communism. So that's why the Cold War analogy is completely wrong. And the second point is that, you know, during the Cold War, there were lots of countries that enthusiastically supported the United States. Western Europe, uh, United Kingdom, France, Germany were solidly on the side of uh, United States. Uh, Japan and South Korea were on the side of United States. Major countries like Egypt, uh, Turkey, um, uh, Pakistan, Indonesia were all on the side of the United States. But today, in the US-China geopolitical contest, and this is what my book documents, most countries in the world say, please, we don't want to get involved, please. Keep us out of this. You know, we, we really think there are more important things in the world to do, like fighting COVID-19. So why are you still having this uh, geopolitical contest? So in the, the many of the people who are making decisions in Washington, D.C., one reason why they get China wrong in a fundamental sense is precisely because they're using the Cold War 
lends us to look at a contest which is very, very different. And that's what I hope my book at the end of the day will do, which is will, will tell them that you must really understand that the Chinese challenge is, is, is very different from the Soviet challenge. And by the way, the United States won against Soviet Union handsomely. You defeated the Soviet Union. Now, what my book says is that consider the possibility, just consider that the United States might lose this contest against China. And just to, this is a small historical fact. The United States of America, which I said is the most successful country on planet Earth, is not even 250 years old. Now, this country, which is less than 250 years old, is taking on a civilization that is 4,000 years old with four times the population. The Soviet Union never had any realistic prospect of having an economy bigger than the United States. But today, in purchasing power parity terms, China's economy is already bigger. And in nominal terms, within 10 to 15 years, the Chinese economy will be bigger. Now, I thought, how can you use the Cold War uh, mentality to deal with a very, very different challenge? And the Chinese challenge is far more sophisticated. I'm not the only one saying this, by the way. In his book on China, Henry Kissinger makes the same point. And as I described in my book, uh, at a one-on-one -on -one lunch I had with Henry Kissinger in March 2018, he told me the fundamental problem with the United States approach to China is that the United States doesn't have a strategy. It doesn't have a strategy to deal with China. So that's what my book tries to do, explain how a strategy can be worked to deal with China. It should be reading for all um, that, and I do hear, at least in the U.S., that uh, among the China watching community, there's there's a very big divide right now, and so it's it will be interesting to see how it shakes out. Um, I, of course, always have other questions, but we are getting a lot of questions in the Q&A box. So I will um, start to turn to the Q&A box and and thank you to those of you who are. Uh, who have already put your questions in, and uh, and I apologize in advance for any name butchering that occurs. Um, it's, it's my fault. Um, so we have a, a, one of the first questions I want to take is from uh, Chuan Jifu, who wants to know what role you think that China is going to play in the U.S.-China geopolitical, or yeah, the, what role do you think Russia is going to play in the U.S.-China geopolitical context? Russia, Russia. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Taking a look at Russia. Uh, well, the that I mean that's a very good question, and um, you know, in theory, Russia is on China's side, uh, and and of course, as you know, it's against the uh, United States, and that that's where today U.S. Russia relations are. Uh, but of course, the sad part of all this is that there's absolutely no reason. Uh, for the United States to have alienated Russia. And, 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 and many Americans, by the way, I'm not the only one, many leading Americans like uh, Tom Friedman, like uh, Henry Kissinger, like Steve Walt, like John Mearsheimer have said that it was a mistake to expand NATO right into the heartland close to uh, the old Soviet Union, the old Russia. And so the United States has unfortunately alienated Russia. And just by, as a contrast, incidentally, so that you understand, uh, during the Cold War, the ASEAN countries, of which Singapore is a part, had a contest against Vietnam, right? So ASEAN and Vietnam were at loggerheads also during the Cold War. But uh, within five years after the end of the Cold War, Vietnam joined ASEAN. <laughs> See, we integrated our former adversary. Whereas, by contrast, the United States and Europe alienated their former adversary, Russia, very unwisely. It wasn't necessary at all. So, in the short run, I think Russia and China will collaborate. But one of the most surprising and indeed shocking things I say in my book is that in the long run, Russia will move closer to the West. And why will Russia move closer to the West? Because the country which has the largest, largest border with China is Russia. <laughs> Now, in the, in, the, in the Cold War, Soviet Union was this powerful and China was this powerful, okay? The Soviet Union was 10 times more powerful. Guess what? Today, China is 10 times more powerful than Russia. 
I mean, look at the GNP sizes, okay? And so you can see that the power relationship with China and Russia has shifted. So over time, the Russians, right, by the way, the Russians do worry privately, of course, very privately, <laughs> about the rise in Chinese power. And so in the long run, if, if the United States and Europe could learn to treat Russia with some respect and, and understand that Russians have their own security concerns and deal with the reality of that and, and instead of provoking Russia. And so I think it, you, you can over time see a situation where Russia will progressively, in a sense, move away from its alliance with China towards getting closer to the West. But that again, going, that's what, what you require is good diplomacy. And unfortunately, the United States has forgotten the art of good diplomacy. So that's what it needs to recover. Yes, yeah, I, I think that the, the, the demographic uh, trends in Russia will, will always sort of lead it to lean toward the West. But, um, but, but like you say, I think that the, the diplomacy has been uh, leave some room for improvement. So we're now going to call um, for someone to ask a question online. So we have uh, Nikita Kozimyakin, uh, who I think will ask a question live right now. Thank you. Nikita, over to you if you're on. Uh, you, you seem to be muted. All right. If, um, Okay, well then, why don't we move on? And, and when Nikita is unmuted, we can we can um, we can take that that question. Um, so um, I'm now going to ask a question from Joanna G, who wants to know how does the concept of ideology factor in the competition between the U.S. and China? Um, the U.S. has traditionally been viewed as an advocate of democracy, human rights, and free speech. And how can China compete against the U.S. and what the PRC advocates? Mm. Well, I think the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in, the, in the Cold War, there were two competing ideologies. Uh, now that there, there are no two competing ideologies because China doesn't, doesn't try to persuade the United States that its system is better than that of the United States. What, what the United States, what China is saying that you can have your system, we can have our system, and we can learn to live with each other. Now, I actually think that it's actually good that the United States uh, supports democracy. It's good that the United States supports human rights. But the best way to promote democracy and human rights is through what I call not your words, it's your deeds, it's through your power of example. And sadly today, if you look at the United States and you ask yourself, has American democracy benefited the, the poor people in America? I want to emphasize that. Huh? Uh, the answer is uh, it hasn't. The, the standard of living of the bottom 50% has gone down. And in, in, in America today, you have what you call a sea of despair among the white working classes uh, in, in America and leading to, you know, uh, suicides, opioid addiction, and so on and so forth. So it, 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 it is the power of example that is more important in terms of promotion of human rights in, in democracy. And in the case of human rights, of course, the uh, United States was always seen as a key defender of human rights until Guantanamo happened. And I you know in Guantanamo, when the United States became the first major developed country to practice torture, the whole world was shocked and said, how can the United States uh, carry out torture? So again, you're going to promote human rights, show it by example, and, and you, wouldn't, you wouldn't respect a priest in, in a church who's speaking to you and preaching good moral values when you know he has a mistress <laughs> on the side. So clearly, you know, you, got, you, got to, you, you, don't, you don't listen to the words of the preacher, you listen to the, you watch the deeds of the preacher. And so I would say the United States should go back to the, to the high standards it had in the past, and that's the best way of promoting democracy and human rights. Thank you. Um, Nikita, I think we have you on now, so uh, if you'd like to ask your question. Thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, I would like to ask you a question about uh, United States and China relations recently. Uh, we all know that 
uh, United States and China don't have a good relations uh, for the past several months, uh, especially in, in the case of COVID-19. Uh, my question is, uh, do we, you really consider these relations to be an absence model, like a confrontation between two superpowers? Or it's more like a confrontation between superpower and a rising power, a more emerging power? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good, good question. Uh, I think you're referring to Graham Allison uh, and his book, Destined for War where he said that, you know, you, the uh, war is more likely than not between the number one power and the emerging power. And, and certainly, I completely agree with him that the contest is being driven by, by that uh, historical uh, dynamic. But I, I don't agree with him, as I said earlier, that war is more likely uh, than not. But at the same time, I also think that while in, I can understand the forces that are driving the United States and China, towards a geopolitical contest. There are also other reasons why they should avoid such a geopolitical contest. And I'm glad you mentioned COVID-19 because I can tell you, you know, the one of the other oldest rule of geopolitics is that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So in World War II, when Churchill, Winston Churchill, one of the great Western leaders, decided that Hitler was his number one enemy, he became friends with Stalin. Now, Churchill and Stalin have nothing in common. Stalin had carried out genocide on his people. But despite the fact he had carried out genocide on his people, Winston Churchill became friendly with Stalin, a genocidal ruler, because they had a common enemy, uh, Hitler. And they, they came together to fight the common enemy. In today's context, a similar analogy is that COVID-19 is an enemy of the United States. COVID-19 is an enemy of China. So following a 2,000 year rule of geopolitics, United States and China should at least come together temporarily to fight COVID-19 and kill COVID-19. That would be a rational response on the part of United States and China. So my goal actually is to try and persuade both countries to set aside their geopolitical differences and focus on helping their own people and that would be better for both of them and better for the rest of the world. Okay, great. Thank you. And, th and thank you, Nikita, for asking that question. We, we appreciate it. Um, so just going through the, the Q&A box, and, and, and I'm going to try to get to as many of these as I can. Um, and so I have a question from uh, Chiang Kiat So, who wants to know, how would such a small country as Singapore choose if it is forced to choose between the US and China? And eventually Singapore may have to choose despite not wanting to. And so this is, a, I think it's a, it, it's a common question that, that a lot of smaller countries face. And uh, mm. you know, your mention of Mearsheimer brings to, brings to mind the, the situation of Ukraine, for example. So I'd be you know, curious to hear, hear your thoughts on that. Thank you for that question. That, you're, you're absolutely right, Courtney. That's a very good question. And in fact, it reflects the anxiety among many, many countries in the world, especially the smaller countries. And the simplest answer to that question is that most countries don't want to choose. And in fact, actually, the Prime Minister of Singapore uh, has been very brave. He gave a speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue in uh, 2019 and then he also published an article in the magazine Foreign Affairs, which is published in New York, uh, on that subject. So if, if any of your viewers or listeners haven't, haven't seen either the speech or the article, I strongly commend both of them to all your viewers and listeners. Because I think what the Prime Minister is trying to say is that Singapore would like to have uh, good relations with the United States. Definitely, we want to have good relations with the United States. We also have good relations with uh, China, and we would like to have good relations with both, and we see no reason why we should be caught in the middle of this uh, uh, zero-sum game between the two. And this, this, brings, this brings me back to the critical point of diplomacy. One of the most important things in diplomacy, you succeed in diplomacy not with your mouth, but with your ears. <laughs> you have to learn to listen. And I think the United States should quietly do a survey of all the 191 other countries in the world and ask them privately, whisper to them, hey, do you want to choose? <laughs> and, 
And most of them, I think, will say, we love you, United States. We want to be close to you. But please don't make us choose between China and the United States. And that, that's virtually a universal message. And just to illustrate that, uh, even the United Kingdom, which is the number one ally of the United States in the Cold War, uh, when I, in January this year, uh, nine months ago in Davos, I asked a very senior and influential British figure, I asked this British figure, are you going to proceed with Huawei, you know? And this senior and influential British figure said to me, Kishore, of course, we'll proceed with Huawei. We have put in our GCHQ of British spies into Huawei. We have scrapped their software. We know exactly what they're doing. Huawei is not a threat. But I said, hang on a second, my friend. Wouldn't the United States twist the arms of the United Kingdom and, and force the UK to join this contest? And he replied to me, you know, a typical British, uh, how do you say, a plum. Excuse me. The United States needs the United Kingdom as much as the United Kingdom needs the United States. And in some ways, he's right, by the way. I agree with that. But despite that, by July, the United Kingdom had capitulated, right? And fell into line. Now, just imagine that. The United States had to arm twist its number one ally in the Cold War to join this contest against China. That shows the reluctance of countries to do so. So I think that's why diplomacy is about listening, listening. And I think the United States, well, very strangely, has lost the art of listening. So I hope my book will help the United States listen to the rest of the world. Thank you. I think, yeah, that's a, it's a, very important point. Um, our next question is from Kevin Sonukan, who wants to know, how do you see the middle income trap that affects countries with a similar trajectory to China, i.e. Japan, affecting its rise in engagement with the rest of the world? Well, you know, I, I'm not a professional economist. And so I cannot engage the debate on the middle income trap. But, you know, I am someone who is skeptical of that claim. If it is really a trap, everyone should fall into it. And, you know, I, I grew up in a Singapore that was very, very poor. In fact, the per capita income of Singapore when I was a child was the same as Ghana, about $500 per capita. And I grew up in a poor family. I was put in a special feeding program when I was... Uh, six years old, we had no flush toilet, and we were in real, we experienced real poverty. Guess what? Today, Singapore's per capita, per capita income is among the highest in the world. Somehow or other, we sailed right through the middle income trap <laughs> and never saw it at all. And I think that's going to be true of many East Asian countries. And just, just to go back to my the very, very first point I made, Courtney, at the beginning of my presentation, from the year one to the year 1820, the two largest economies in the world were China and India. So the, the Asian underperformance over the last 200 years was an aberration. Now, if you want to understand how well Asians can perform, please go to the leading American universities. And when the list of PhDs are read out, right, in science and technology and engineering and biotechnology, look at the number of Asian names that are coming. And look at the two of the biggest companies in the world, Microsoft and Google, run by Asians, right, by two Indians. So, so that I would say it is safer, safer <laughs> to overestimate <laughs> what Asian countries may do rather than to underestimate, right? So just get ready for a very different world. And that's, I've been writing about this only for 30 years. So, and so far it's come true. <laughs> you haven't been immersed in it at all. So, um, oh, wonderful. Um, thank you. We have one, we have another viewer or listener who wants to ask a question live and they, they've promised that they will introduce themselves uh, because their screen name is Snapdragon. So, um, over to you for a question. If you can unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, I, I am interested 
in global geopolitics thank you so much kishor read your books uh, thank you. Thank just to uh, ask you a question in all your analysis and historical analogies uh, one thing uh, that is very different today when compared to uh, all of human history is we never had a power like united states which even controlled global trade through say the status that uh, a fiat currency has we never had such a situation ever before whether it was the spanish dollar there were other ways to run global trade but nothing where somebody could just create it uh, via fiat and uh, over the last 10 to 12 years since the financial crisis what the world has seen is the reliance on united states becoming the preeminent issuer of this fiat has also increased despite countries like china and others that were running huge surpluses worrying about uh, excessive trade surpluses that uh, they were running on us dollar uh, and one of the critical impacts of this is uh, whatever whichever country trades with china if I think we lost you. Are you still there? I I got the question yeah. though. Yes. Okay. Well, 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 what, what, if you want to, to, if, if you have some points that you want to elaborate on and then we'll, we can, can move on. Um, so shall I respond first? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, the question was a very good question. And the questioner is absolutely right. And, and, and by the way, I want to emphasize, I want to strongly support him when he said that the amount of power that the United States has enjoyed globally, especially for most of the 20th century, was exceptional, was amazing. Really, I mean, you know, at one stage, uh, I think um, around the 1990s, the United States was spending more on defense than the rest of the world combined. <laughs> And that's a shocking statistic. The United States had less about less than five percent of the world's population, but less than five percent of the world's population could spend more on defense than the rest of the world combined. Of course, you can ask yourself why was that necessary, but that's a separate question. <laughs> the United States could do that, but the, the question that uh, put put his finger on a very important point, which is on the role of the U.S. dollar, and I completely agree with the premise that the U.S. dollar has enhanced. America's power in the world. And in fact, actually, as the, as the French always say, uh, when the US dollar is used as a global reserve currency, it gives the United States an exorbitant privilege. And it gives an exorbitant privilege because the Chinese have to work very hard in their factories to produce products like refrigerators, vacuum cleaners to export to the United States. And what the United States has to do is just print money. And then he can pay for this Chinese product. So that's the exorbitant privilege of having the dollar as a global reserve currency. And I also agree with the questioner that as long as the, U the US dollar remains the global reserve currency, the United States enjoys exceptional power. But at the same time, when you enjoy exceptional power, and this is what I discuss in my book, the US dollar, which is a source of strength for the United States, can also become the Achilles heel of the United States. And how can it become the Achilles heel of the United States? Because the United States has been actually weaponizing the US dollar and using it as a weapon against countries, for example, uh, Iran. And so and, you know, in response, even three of the United States allies, UK, France, and Germany, tried to set up an alternative payments mechanism for Iran, inspects to not rely on the US dollar. Now that's a big dangerous sign when your key allies don't want to use the US dollar, then there's a danger of the US dollar no longer being a global reserve currency. And, and the danger for America is quite simply is this. If when, you're, when your currency is a global reserve currency, you can live beyond your means because you know what happens is that even if you don't export enough products, you can print money <laughs> to buy the excess of imports. But when you're no longer the global reserve currency, you can no longer print money. So you have to go back to live, live, beyond your mean, live within your means. And so American standards of living could come down significantly if the US dollar is no longer the global reserve currency. So that's why my book is in some ways a gift to the United States because I, I try to explain to the United States 
since the uh, US dollar is an exorbitant privilege, don't weaponize it. Don't use it against other countries. Actually, you want the rest of the world to depend on the US dollar more and more and more for many more years, rather than to reduce their dependence. And, and that's what I fear is going to happen if the United States continues to weaponize the US dollar. Thank you, and, th and thank you for that question as well. Um, uh, I'd like to turn to Emanuela Habsburg, who wants to know what should the US reaction be to China's fortifications in the South China Sea? We haven't touched on that at all. Uh, yes, I think the South China Sea will be uh, a major area of contention between the United States and China. And by the way, I have a very interesting story uh, in my book uh, from an American ambassador, Stephen Conroy, who said that actually President Xi Jinping offered to President Obama to not militarize the South China Sea. Unfortunately, the U.S. Navy rejected that offer, it's very, very sadly. By the same time, the Chinese have also made a serious mistake uh, in the South China Sea by drawing a nine dash line in the South China Sea. And of course, the nine dash line uh, is a source of great puzzlement and mystery to everybody because the Chinese on the one, uh, the government on the one hand says that, that there is a nine dash line. And on the other hand, they also say, but the, the nine dash line doesn't mean that the waters within the nine dash line are territorial waters of China. So if that's the case, what exactly does the nine dash line mean? And I think that was a big mistake on the part of uh, China to have that nine dash line. And of course, it's also unfortunate that there has been the building of uh, islands in uh, South China Sea. But uh, to be fair, it wasn't started by China. It was the other claimants, unfortunately, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, who started reclaiming land in the South China Sea, which is unwise. But of course, when they reclaim land, they can only reclaim 20 acres. The China can reclaim 2,000 acres. <laughs> so it's a, it's a contest that should not have started because of course it's a contest that China will win. By the end of the day, I also think, again, uh, that if both sides are wise, we can avoid a conflict in the South China Sea. And I, again, in my book, I discuss how that can be done. Terrific. I think we have time for one last question. And as those of us in the US will be going from this talk to probably uh, right to a uh, presidential debate, I wanted to turn to a question from Natalie Mays, and I might put a spin on it as well. So she says, thank you, Mr. Mabubani. Could you please elaborate on what you meant when you said the US would be better off as the second largest economy than trying to keep its spot as the largest? And to bring it to, to, the, to the current situation as we head into the debates, what would your advice be for, for, for the uh, presidential candidates on that regard? Yeah. That, that's a very good question. And I think at the end of the day, if I was an American citizen, I would say what really matters to America, and this is what George Kennan, one of the great strategic thinkers, emphasized, is the spiritual vitality of American society. American society must show through its words and deeds that it is the most successful society inside the United States of America. And guess what? The United States, even if it becomes the number two economy in terms of GNP, can still be perceived by the world to be the most successful society because the American per capita income, even today, is six times that of the average Chinese uh, per capita income. So you can actually have a, enjoy, a, the American people can enjoy a much better life and actually focus on improving their lives, even if they're the number two economy in the world. So there's no, there's no, it doesn't mean that when you're becoming, when you become number two, the American people will suffer. That's why I, I keep emphasizing that what the United States leaders should do, and I don't think we mentioned the debate between Trump and Biden, they shouldn't focus on being the number one economy in the world in terms of overall size. They should be focused on becoming the number one society in terms of quality of living and quality of life for the American people. And I think that can still continue in America, even if you're the number two largest economy in the world. And that's what America should focus on. Well, that is a terrific place to end, and, and I hope that that, uh, that memo gets received. Um, and we're, it looks like we're right at time. So, Professor Mabubani, thank you so much for, for joining us today. I think this was a really, it was really wonderful to be able to spend this time with you, and you have some really, you know, just fantastic thoughts, and I appreciate your being so candid. 
Um, you know, for those of you who are listening, we do have a few events upcoming. Our next one is on October 9th at noon, and it's on disinformation uh, in the U.S. election. And so we have Yael Eisenstadt and Nina Jankowitz who will be talking about um, their takes on uh, on that topic. So please do please do register. Um, and again, Professor Mavabani, thank you so much for for your work and 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 insights. Have Thank a good you. have a good day and uh, and and good evening to all of those of you who are on the East Coast. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.